I'm coming here a long time and it, it never gets old. Yeah, it's always great to be here at Church on the Street. You know, Pastor Ron, I was watching all your testimonies up here. I'm like, the thought hit me. It's like, man, I wonder how many Church on the Street t-shirts are going to be in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be a lot of t-shirts. Church on the Street shirts in, in heaven, right? People you don't even know all over the world. This man's great. Give this guy, this guy. I know he didn't want it, but I tell you what, he loves you guys. And, uh, he's got an amazing heart, and I appreciate him so much. And thank you for letting me come. Um, it's always an opportunity. It really is. always a blessing to be here. It truly really is. I want to talk to you about something tonight that's obviously that I'm living out, and God is really teaching me. I want to talk to you about the strategy of God. Do you know the strategy of God? In your life? <laughs> I've actually titled this Lost Donkeys. Okay? ask you a question. Do you ever ask God, why did God do that? When you're reading through the Bible, do you ever ask God, why did he do that? I mean, go back to the Old Testament and read it. Why in the world did that happen? God, why did you allow that to happen? Why, why did it happen? Have you ever asked why, why God, why he allows things to happen in your life now that you're a Christian? Shouldn't it be different? Right? You know, Ever ask God why He does something and uses things seemingly Im seemingly insignificant things that He uses in your life? Yes. Yeah. You're like, why did God ask me to do that? Why did God take me there? Why did God allow that to happen in my life? You ever ask God that? You know, the Bible's filled with events, stories, miracles that are unexplainable and can be downright confusing. When you meet somebody that thinks they've got God all figured out, I'll tell you somebody that is so confused in their life. Okay? Nobody has him figured out. He's God, right? How God works is mind-boggling to you and I. You know, the scripture says he'll use the foolish thing to confound the wise, right? He's God. All powerful, all knowing, and will do what it takes to save us. I think the resurrection, the cross, and the resurrection, the whole Easter, th that proves that, right? You know, you'll be confused if you do not believe that God always has a purpose in what He does in your life. What He allows, and where He takes you. You'll be confused if you try to figure it out. If you don't believe that. God is a strategic God. He's strategic in what He does. He is not a God of casual afterthought planning. He doesn't say, oops, didn't see that coming. i got to go back and fix that. He doesn't do that. He's very strategic, very sovereign. He knows what He's doing. We must believe and all things... And we, and we know, there are, get the scripture right here. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, right? For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. So everything that's going on in your life... He's using it to conform you, shape you for your purpose in the likeness of Christ. Isn't that awesome? He is conforming you to His likeness. That's what this simply means. It simply means God has a plan for you. Has a purpose for you. Though it might get messy and confusing along the way, 
He's just simply conforming you to His likeness. But His strategy for our lives is always unique, always special. You cannot compare what's happening to your life and where you're going to someone else. You can't do that. You can get advice. You can see what God is doing. But your call, your purpose, the plan for God for you is unique. We must not compare ourselves with others. Remember what happened when Peter did that after the resurrection? Jesus confronts him. Because he denied him. <laughs> and he said to Peter, he said, Peter, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? This is after Jesus had told Peter, this is going to happen to you. Peter didn't like it. So, what about John? Right? And I love what Jesus said. Jesus said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You follow me. God's strategy for your life is different than anyone else. But you must follow even when you're confused. Even when you don't understand. Even when you're absolutely blown away. Listen, I've been in the ministry for 38 years. I've never been more confused in the last year and a half in all my life. Okay? So I want to give you a non-Easter story as an illustration tonight, okay? A story most of us pay little attention of because it's just kind of like one of those things. But every Bible, every word in the Bible is written for a reason, right? But it's a story, yeah, I saw. Israel was ruled by judges and was, wasn't, it wasn't working out. The Bible says in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's when you get into trouble, right? It didn't work out because they didn't want God as their king, right? They wanted to fix things. And so they go to Samuel and say, we want a king. Samuel sort of takes it personally. They wanted to be like other nations, other people. We want to be like them. Right? God tells Samuel to give them their king, but to warn them of what that means. He will control your lives. He'll take your sons. He'll take your daughters. He'll tax you. He'll do this. He'll do that. He did, but they still wanted this king, right? God had Saul picked out. He was a handsome warrior who stood heads and shoulders above everyone else. He could have elevated him quickly. He could have done that. God could have led Samuel right to him. But God strategically was planning. This was interesting. God used lost donkeys to lead Saul to Samuel. Now you read that in the, new, in the old King James Version and you don't want to go there. Okay? Alright? God used the seemingly insignificant get that to lead Saul to Samuel. From there his life was forever changed. Now to you and I a donkey is nothing, right? But back then, they were very important. Source of travel, like somebody stealing your cars, okay? You know, they used for work. But donkeys, come on, can't you replace those? You know, I have no idea why God used donkeys, just like I have no idea why God does a lot of things in my life. <clears throat> but, Samuel, but Saul's dad comes to him and says, Son, the donkeys are gone. I need you to go find them. Take a servant and go find them. So off they went, traveled for days, couldn't find these dumb donkeys, all right? They looked everywhere, they couldn't find them. After a few days, you know, Saul, Saul's, the, Saul turns to the servant and says, you know, Dad's going to start worrying about me, I need to get back. You know, I need to get back. And the servant says, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, we have one more option. We're close to where a prophet is, a prophet of God. Maybe we can go see him and see if he knows where they are. They were called seers back then. Maybe we can go see the seer. So they went on. I'm cutting the story really short. They went on um, and come, and of course they, they find Samuel. Samuel calls Saul in and says, I want you to have dinner with me. 
He sits down, he, he talks with him. He says, Saul, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Saul's like, what? What are you talking about? Who am I? And by the way, the donkeys, they're okay. They're back with you now. Okay? God just used them to get you to me. Insignificant. God just used them to get, get, get them to me. Get you to me. So what he does is he anoints Saul. Saul receives his instructions. And, Saul, and Samuel says, I need you to go a little bit further. i got some people I want you to meet. He goes and he prophesies. And listen to this scripture because this is what it's all about. Then the Spirit of the Lord, this is 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. And you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Those insignificant donkeys changed a man's life. Led him to be king. You know, we all have times when we take things for granted. What seems insignificant. A waste of time. Donkeys, if you will. But as we search and go through the process, our lives are forever changed. We search. Saul had to go through the process in order for his life to be completely changed. Are you with me? Yes. I'm reading a book. Joel Osteen's a cool guy. All right? Some like him, some don't. I like him. Okay? He's an encourager. Really is. But he has a book out. He gave me an idea for this sermon. So, I, you know, I read a lot of things. You know, and he, and he came across this point called faith in the middle. Okay? It's easy to have faith at the start. Excellent. I mean, you're excited. The adrenaline's flowing. You received a, uh, a new challenge or you received the Lord... It's faith at the end is pretty good too. Because you know, hey, I've achieved this goal. I've seen victory. I'm here. The challenge is having faith in the middle when it takes longer than you thought. When you don't have the funds. When you, the, the medical report is not that good. It takes faith to hold on. You were excited when he was an infant baby, but now he's a teenager. What do you do? Right? You understand what I'm saying? And this is his quote from his book. I want to read it because it's really cool. You can't control everything that happens to you. Just be your best and trust God to take care of the rest. He is not just the God of the start. Not just the God of the finish. He is the God of the middle. He has put you in the palm of His hand right now. He is working out His plans for your life. Amen. Sounds like Joel Osteen, but isn't that a great quote? That's a great quote. You know, though there is a season, and we know God, it's a tough time to go through. And we know God is leading us doesn't get any easier, does it? That's right. That's right. When you're stuck in the middle, you know, you know you turned a corner when you accepted Christ or when you came to church on the street. Yes. Right? Yes. You know good things happen. But then the program starts. <laughs> you can't wait till you get finished. Alright? But even in your own personal walk with God, you're excited. You understand that Jesus died for you and He has set you free. You have a new life in Him. And at the beginning, that is awesome. But then you've got to start learning. Then you've got to start growing. Boy, it is tough. What you don't realize is you just entered into a big war for your soul. Okay? <laughs> so how do we get through the middle? What is God's strategy here? How do we work with the seemingly insignificant things and know that all things work together for good? Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. 
And I want to start with verse 19. We're going to read it as we go. But I'm going to give you a few thoughts tonight that will help you to get through the middle. That will help you to stop trying to figure everything out of how God is going to work and, and stop you from getting discouraged and stop you from getting frustrated. And there's a few things just to focus on in this scripture. First of all, when you're feeling that discouragement, when you're in the middle you know what God wants to do. You know and understand He's got a purpose for your life. And some of you may not already know what it is. You may be heading that way. But you're kind of like in the middle. When you know that, and all of a sudden, man, you're getting pounded by the evil one. Things just aren't working out like you wanted to do. You're having to do things that look so insignificant. First thing you do is look to the cross. Look to the cross. Look what it says in Hebrews 10, 19 through 21. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, keep your eyes on the cross. What Jesus did. We need a cross reference every day in our life. We do. Remember, Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, whatever you call it, and the price that was paid for us to live free and fulfill. You've got to remember that, first of all. See, God wouldn't have sent His Son to suffer and die for us and not pull us through this. What, what is that? He sent His Son to give us life, life more abundant. Okay? We don't understand totally His strategy all the time of the cross, but He went to the cross for us. He rose from the dead for us. When you accept Him as your Savior, all of a sudden you're on His team, and what He did for you comes alive. You understand what I'm saying to you? So why in the world would he go through all of that and say, oh, I'm just teasing you, son. You're going to have to go through it anyway. That's not our God. He died for you. That's what that means. He died for the plan that he put inside of you, the purpose that he brought into your life. The cross not only represents death to our old man, but it is a guide that Jesus is leading us into newness. And you've got to keep your eyes on it. The scripture says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What is he describing? He's describing the cross and what Jesus did. Think on what he has already done in your life. I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about what God has already done. It's a miracle that we're in this room today. Amen. It's a miracle that you're alive. Amen. And you know why you're alive? Because God's got a purpose. God's got a plan. God's got a strategy for you. And His strategy for you led you to church on the street. His strategy for you is get through this program and change. about Peter. You know, he denies Christ before the cock crowed three times. Okay? Peter lost hope. He went back to his old lifestyle. Fishing. Right? Why? Why? He was confused. Right? Peter had forgotten his experience with Jesus and his call. Jesus had already told him, upon you, I will build my church. That was his purpose. That was what Jesus called him to do. That's what he was designed and made to do. But see, he got confused 
and failure intercepted his hope. Right? How often do we do that? How often do we do that? Jesus had to show him the cross. As painful as it was, it was all a part of God's strategy for Peter's call. When you keep your eyes on the cross, you remember what He's given you. When you learn His promises, when you figure out your purpose that He has for you, keep your eye on the cross because when you're going through the middle, it gets pretty confusing and pretty difficult at times. But if you remember where He's brought, where he's brought you from, then you can get to where you're going, where He's taking you. Remember the cross. Look to the cross. It's the same for you and I today to look to the cross when you're in the middle. And remember, it is... I love this thought. The cross didn't defeat Jesus. Jesus defeated it. <coughs> so remember how far you've come. Look to the cross. Think about it. Second, if you're in the middle, you want to get to this, you want to, you want to keep going? It's frustrating? This is a good one. Let God love you. Let God love you. Look at the scripture. Let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. As I'm thinking about the scripture. Draw near simply implies learning to love God and allowing God to love you. Now, how does He do that? How does He love you? He cleanses our hearts, makes us new. This is something, and sometimes it's painful. But sometimes surgery is necessary. The problem comes when we fight the discipline or the surgery God wants to do in us. That's the problem. You're fighting against His love. <laughs> Stay with me here. You may not understand the seemingly insignificant thing that God is using in your life or wants to take out of your life. Let God work. Do what He is asking you to do. What you're assigned to do every day is a step in the right direction. In Hebrews 12, you guys know that one pretty, pretty familiar probably. After we are instructed to look, into Je to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and strip off every weight and every thing, every sin that hinders us, Look what he says. Look what he goes on to say. Verse 6, it says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Stay with me. The stripping off things is an act of letting God love you. Trusting Him, trust in Him enough to let it go. Okay? Are you with me? Those things that you're holding on to, those thoughts of the way things were, the old life, whatever it might be, maybe just your own everyday character, God is saying, I want to strip it off because I love you. I love you. Trust me enough and let me heal you. That's what a good father does. That's what a good Lord does. It's, it's hard sometimes. It's difficult sometimes. It's painful sometimes. Let Him love you. Okay, Lord, 
I surrender all. Some tonight are struggling with trusting God with it all. With it all. Going through the seemingly insignificant processes is frustrating you. God has just got you to this point because He's wanting to love you more. You're at a breaking point in your relationship with the Lord. Let Him love you. Learn a father's love. I had to learn a father's love. Before I could even become a good father, I had to learn a father's love. And I didn't have a good father when I'm growing up. Learn a father's love. And all of a sudden, you know, so many times we just want to sit around and think that God is just... All he, all he wants to do is just, and he does, he wants to give us all good things. But before we can give us all good things, he has to take away some things that we don't need. That we've had long to. He's got to do surgery. He's got to fix what you've broken. What Satan's broken. It hurts. It's painful. And we start getting angry and mad at God. Stop it. <laughs> Say, Lord, it's all yours. Lord, love me. I'm going to let you love me. Does that make sense to you? I've learned that a father's love sometimes is pretty tough. <coughs> oh, it's fantastic. It's great. We, 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 we want to just surround ourselves in His presence and be caught up with Him. Yes, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, and we should all the time. <coughs> but if you want to live that way, let Him tear out those things that He said, Son, you need to get rid of. My daughter, you need to pull out of your life. You need to turn from this. Might surprise you. Let him love you. Number three. Believe what you confess. <clears throat> Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful. You know, it's great to speak faith, hope, and love. And we can do it. We learn this Christianese. It's a Christian language that we learn. And we say it just to get by. Right? We'll throw out cliches. We'll throw out all this stuff. <laughs> you know, faith, hope, and love. And we should. But we must also believe it enough to do it. It's a kind of a character change. When you are in the middle, you almost hate those who speak faith, hope, and love. Come on. You don't want to be around that positive person. I am not feeling it today. I'm not too spiritual. Right? I want to feed my fear. And so we kind of hide. See, Satan wants your words, my words, to be lifeless, negative. And focused on what is wrong. And when you live that way and that's how your words are coming out, I want to tell you something. All of a sudden, you seem to draw those kind of people to you. All of a sudden, all those negative people, you ever wonder, why are all these negative people around me? <laughs> Hint. <laughs> why do I check all these people? Well, maybe God needs to do some loving on you. If you want change, where, you're, where you are headed in your life, believe what you confess. See, that, that's a struggle sometimes. We say it, but do we believe it? It's really a heart issue. The Bible says the good person of a good heart out of the good treasures of his heart produces good. 
And the evil person out of the evil treasures produce evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Some tonight need that time when you just empty yourself up. Ask him to help you with your unbelief. It's okay to admit, you know, I'm not sure. It's okay to admit, I'm struggling with this. Jesus had that happen to him. The father comes, and, you know, the son is convulsing and dying. And Jesus said, do you believe? And he goes, I believe, but I unbelief. And he healed the son. Sometimes an honest confession just simply means that you really want God to change you. Right? If you confess it, act on it. Whether you feel like it or not, act on it. Do it. Do it. And then the last one here, because I know it's getting late. You're in the middle and you want to get through. Shine on. Okay? And let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Listen, when you're in the middle, and you're confused, and you're frustrated, that is not the time to stay out of church. I, 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 as a pastor for that so many years, I, I couldn't believe that. Yeah, I was just not feeling, feeling, I mean, you know, I was discouraged, I was feeling down, so I just decided to have a day to myself. <laughs> what? And that's why you're down and discouraged, right there. Right? The point is, when you are in the middle, surround yourself with people who have the same God-like values. They can lift you up and you can lift them up. Isolation is destructive. The Bible says a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires. He rages against all wise judgment. The bottom line is Satan wants to get you alone. He wants to get you alone. We often hide out when we are hurting and confused. And that is exactly where he wants you because he wants your light to go dim. Okay? He wants your light to go dim. I've experienced it over the past year and a half. My wife and I both, we, we got to the point where it's like, man, this is a lonely place. We pastored a church for 24 years. Still living in the same community. People scattered. Stop calling. Stop coming by. Friends start to stop connecting with you. You lose contact. And you're kind of like, wow, this is a lonely place. And you know what? Satan starts to tell you all kinds of stupid things. Well, they don't love you anymore. They don't like you. You offended them. And so you start acting crazy, right? And you start blaming yourself, and guilt comes on you. You start, I've been through this process, guys. That's where Satan wants you. But you know what God spoke to me and said, no. I've wanted you alone so I could love you, okay? Love you more. It's not their fault. They're not coming to talk to you. Why haven't you called them? Why haven't you gone to them? Why haven't you done this? Amen. See, we make these excuses, don't we? But the bottom line is, is Satan wants to put your light out. When you're going through the middle, 
you know God has got great things in store because he's got this perfect this purpose and plan for your life and you're going to get through this middle part that's hard, that's confusing, that's struggling. You're, you're doing insignificant stuff, you feel. Shine on. Be with people. Love people. Love God. Be an encourager. Sometimes the best encouragement that you can get is from somebody who's going through a lot of pain. That's the truth. Sometimes the best encouragement that you can give is out of your heart. You know what it does? It takes your mind off of what you're going through and it puts your focus back on the cross. Right? So tie it on. God needs your life for others. Shine on. I'm going to wrap this up here. Everything you are going through today may seem senseless. Especially when you are doing things right. Man, I'm doing things right. Rob, why do I got to do this? This is crazy. Why did this come up? Right? God has a strategy for your life. Let Him move. Don't complain. Just do it. Look to the cross. Let God love you. Believe in what you confess. Shine on. Back to King Saul, by the way. He failed. God gave him a chance to repent. And maybe he may not have continued being king, but I believe God would have used him in some capacity. But he didn't want that. Oh, he said, I'm sorry a bunch of times. But envy and pride destroyed him and his sons. Jesus came to save us. Reconstruct us for his designed destiny for our life. Let that repentance be genuine, sincere when you cry out to him. You see, he came to save us and constructed Ephesians 2.10. You guys know that one? For why? For good works. But do you know that God knew you before you were even born? Before He even placed you in your mother's womb. Jeremiah 1.5. He knew you. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for what you do in all of our lives. Nothing that you ask us to do as your sons and daughters are in vain. There's strategy. There's reasons. Though it may be insignificant to us, it will lead us to change and become new. The Lord right now is in this time together. I just want to pray ask you to touch these, our brothers and sisters. Have you given him all tonight? Have you given God everything? Let him love you by showing you what you need to get rid of and get rid of it. Trust him enough to let it go. And if you're struggling with unbelief tonight, ask him to help you with that. He doesn't condemn you. He loves you. He wants to show you. Father, thank you, Lord, for this evening. And I just pray to draw us all near to you, God. Every person in this room, God, you love deeply. You have designed a plan for their lives. You want to use them. Church on the street, the dream center, this is just all a part of the strategy to get them where you want them to be. But it gets hard, God, in the middle. And I just pray, Lord, that you would begin to strengthen each one of them, guide them in their walk with you, 
keep us focused on the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm going to cut your head off, you uncircumcised Philistine. Amen. Ha, you might fool everybody else, but you ain't fooling me. I don't need Saul's armor. All I need is what the abilities you've given me. And so sling a few stones. Come on, you uncircumcised Philistine. I'm going to hit you head on, and I'm going to cut your head off. Because God told you to do that. <laughs> Pastor Steve, we're going to pray for us. So we'll be willing to do that. Stay with me and we can sit in line. Father, I just thank you again tonight for this 
lovely church, church that's making a difference. Thank you, Father, for how you speak to each and every one of us. So unique, so different. And God, you, we can't judge anyone. We just have to focus on us. Father, I want to pray that you'd help us to do that, God. We're your children. You love every, every one of us so much. Father, I just sense and feel sometimes that we don't know when, maybe we don't know when or how you speak to us. And sometimes Satan uses that to put fear in our hearts. But I pray that God, you would give us a hunger for your word because your word is life. Your word is the living word. You teach us your voice through your word. The Holy Spirit is there to guide us. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit. That thing inside of us that says, do this or do that. We need to trust that as you. Because God, even if we make a wrong decision, you can make it right. But the best thing, the worst thing we can do is not make decisions. So, Father, I just ask you, to help us to learn to hear your voice. Help us to learn to know when you're, you're calling us to you. Father, to know when you're, you're saying gently, remove this from your life. Add this discipline. Speak to that person. Go to this store. Lord, that's the kind of relationship you have and want with us. But Lord, we get up and we live so chaotically sometimes that we forget that you're with us every day and you're there to guide us. Lord, I think all of us have things in our lives where we deal with the unbelief. Forgive us and help us. Help us. And I, I don't know, Lord, in my heart right now, I just, I just have this burden to pray for those that have a hard time trusting a father a figure maybe it's even a man father the thing about it is is that you're not a man or a woman you're God we refer to you as our father because that's who you are my Lord, I just pray that you would comfort those that have never had a father or that have had a father that has hurt them to mislead them. And so they just shut out any voice, any thought of listening to someone in authority. I just ask you, God, to heal them, to touch them tonight. Because you are a father that loves us in such an amazing way. You want to hold us close. And you know how to love each and every person in this room. And you even love us differently, God. Help us to hear your voice. To know your voice. And to not let Satan distort your voice. In the name of Jesus. Guide us, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Wait a minute. Moses, to pray us out. He's been sick and God, he's here tonight. So pray us out, Moses. David. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word that went out, Lord. I pray that you go with us, be with us, continue to teach us, Lord, and let us all do it again tomorrow. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.